good afternoon. And I wrestled about what to talk about today, thinking to myself how excited a bunch of clergy will be to be gathered on a Saturday afternoon. <laughs> um, and what I want to say at the start is I think Christian ministry is a remarkably exciting vocation. It's uh, amazing when we see God at work. It's amazing when we see God do stuff amongst us. It's amazing when we see answers to prayer. But also Christian ministry is flipping hard work. I get to spend a lot of my time all over these islands with clergy and with lay leaders and I see the sheer hard graft. Whether that's monuments that are falling down, and all the pre of course they're beautiful and gorgeous, I know, but all the hassles that they bring with roofs and leaks and the pressure to cover more and more services with less and less people, the pastoral stuff that pops up day after day after day, the funerals, the demands placed upon us by meetings, the finances. I mean, I'm sure you all did a great module on balancing a balance sheet when you were at Vicar School, didn't you? <laughs> but also trying to find time to be a paired up member of the human race. To actually be a human being, a parent, a spouse, a friend. And to do all of that as a minister of the gospel in a country going through a ringer is flipping hard work. So on one level, if you remember nothing else I say today, which is more than plausible, on one level, if you remember nothing else I say, it was worth my while driving from Sheffield to say thank you. And maybe it takes a lay person to tell a bunch of clergy, thank you. Thank you for what you do, for your faithfulness to God and the gospel, for your heart for his people, for keeping going when life is hard. Because I have a hunch, I have a hunch, that there isn't one of you in this room today who couldn't do something else with your life and earn more money, work less hours, not have to be in a seminar on a Saturday afternoon and have less crap to deal with. I suspect none of you here. <laughs> and I dare to suggest, I, you see, I dare to suggest that you're here for three reasons. Number one, you love God. Yeah. Oh, that's a relief. <laughs> <laughs> number one, you love God. Yeah. Number two, you love people. Yeah. And number three, you want more people to love God. Yeah. That's why you're here. That's why you put your hand up. And in a, in a world of here I am, send her, you didn't do it. You put your hand up and said, no, I'll go. I'll go. I'll do it, Lord. I'll go. I'll be a priest. I'll be a, a minister. I will do my best to serve you and the gospel. So ever since I've been invited to do this uh, engagement, which is about a year ago, I think, I've been praying for you. My staff have been praying for you. And as I prayed for you, I heard above all a desperate call from God to tell you, the clergy of the Diocese of St. David's, thank you. God's proud of you. God loves you too, you know. Rebecca Solnit argues that the world is changed by hope-filled people. Yeah, good. That's what changes the world. Hope-filled people. Now, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, I have never heard a better definition for the church in all my entire life. We are not a bunch of people who are either optimists or pessimists. We are a hopeful people. Amen. Because we meet this side of the cross, this side of the resurrection, and on this side of Pentecost. We are a hope-filled people. Brothers and sisters, is that not the ingredient this world needs right now? This nation needs? I watched Question Time the other evening, which is bad for the soul, but I watched it. I thought, this country is just split right down the middle. It's crying out for hope and leadership and vision. In a world of turmoil and change and uncertainty, people need hope. In a world of Trump and Brexit and food banks and payday loans, people need hope. In a world of loneliness and mental health issues, people need hope. And let me say this to you, I'm so glad Joanna said this at the start. The world will not be changed and the church will not be changed by an initiative from the diocese or the synod or the governing body. The world will be changed when Christian people sow hope in their communities day after day. Amen. Now I sit in a lot of meetings in the Church of England. I wonder sometimes when Jesus was standing on the shore of Galilee, did he know I'd have to read 400 pages for a meeting on Tuesday? <laughs> And every meeting I go to in the Church of England right now is about growth. 
Now you might think as the leader of Church Army, who spends his life arguing for growth, that I'd be quite pleased. And over the course of the last year, I find myself more and more uncomfortable that every meeting I'm going to is about growth. And I couldn't work out why. Because, Mark, for goodness sake, you're an evangelist. You want the church to grow. Why are you stressed the church is talking about growth? And I went on a retreat and I nailed why I was annoyed the church was talking about growth. Do you know what it is? Because I don't think growth is the single biggest issue the church needs to get right. I think the single biggest issue the church needs to get right is how to nurture discipleship. Can I ask a favor? Would you mind swapping those around? Which my battery seems to have died on my clicker. Um, I think the single biggest issue is discipleship. Because if growth is the issue, then all we're worried about is putting more bums on seats on Sunday, you're getting more money in the collection plate. But if we don't focus on what happens when all of those extra people who come into church, what they do when they leave, thank you, then what was the point of bringing them in in the first place, other than trying to save our institution from closure? What we're about is bigger than saving the church from closure. We're about the transformation of the world. We're about the transformation of human lives. We're about the transformation of community. We're about men and women leaving the church so full of the Holy Spirit that they sow and whisper hope every word they go. Isn't that right? Yeah. So therefore, the critical question facing the church is discipleship. And when we nail that one, I believe we grow. In other words, by focusing on fruitfulness, We've got the cart before the horse. What we have to do is focus on faithfulness. And faithfulness leads to fruitfulness. The goal is not growing the church. The goal is the transformation of the world and the bringing in the kingdom of God. But I believe as a passionate evangelist that as we raise the bar of discipleship in our church, we find evangelism flows from that and then the church grows. I came across a book a number of years ago by Bill Hybels called Courageous Leadership. And I read this paragraph and it made me cry. There's nothing like the local church when it's working right. Its beauty is indescribable. It's par, good Northern Irish word there, par. <laughs> not power, par. It's par. And par is breathtaking. Its potential unlimited. It comforts the grieving and heals the broken in the context of community. It builds bridges to seekers and offers truth to the confused. It provides resources to those in need and opens its arms to the forgotten, the downtrodden, the disillusioned. It breaks the chains of addictions, frees the oppressed, and offers belonging to the marginalized of the world. Whatever the capacity for human suffering, the church has a greater capacity for healing and wholeness. Still to this day, the potential of the local church is more than I can grasp. No other organization on the earth is like the church. Nothing comes close. Who wants to belong to a church like that? <laughs> well. That's what we're here for, isn't it? So here's my tuppence worth about how we do that. Number one, we go where Jesus would go. Beginning of the, the ministry of Jesus Christ, he was in the temple, surrounded by lots of leaders and religious leaders. Now, if you pushed me for my favorite scripture, it's like asking me my favorite wine or gin, but you push me for my favorite scripture, I would land on Luke chapter four. That moment, surrounded by all the hoi polloi, in the middle of the temple, he unravels the scroll and in a loud voice says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, freedom, of prison, uh, freedom for the prisoner, recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free and proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Mm. And then, in a moment of dramatic flourish, he says, Today, in your midst, that scripture has been full. I often think if that was an episode of EastEnders, that would be the doom, 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 doom. <laughs> because brothers and sisters, you can take everything that Jesus ever said and everything that Jesus ever did and filter it through those words. That was the manifesto of Jesus of Nazareth. And brothers and sisters, the Great Commission and Pentecost means that is the manifesto of Jesus of Nazareth's followers. To ask the question, who are the poor and what's impoverishing them? Who are the prisoners? And who's imprisoning them? And what's imprisoning them? Who are the blind and what's blinding them? Who are the oppressed and what are they oppressed by? Jesus went to the broken, to the cast out, the sinner, the prostitute, the tax collector. Those who society looked down on, ignored, excluded. Jesus found a way to include. Most of his miracles were with people who everybody else ignored. He was making a statement. These are the people that God has yearnings 
to draw closer to himself. Brothers and sisters, think of your streets, your villages, your towns, your communities. The streets around where your congregations worship. What's going on behind the doors you've not been behind? Where are the itches in those communities that God's calling you as a church to scratch? How can your church be freshly good news to that place? To be seen as hope-filled people. You see, I don't think dioceses to, to change the course need one or two big, fat, swanky ideas. I think what dioceses need is every church to try two or three little ideas. Yeah. Yeah. It's not one person taking a hundred steps forward. It's a hundred people taking one step forward. That's how you turn this. I don't know, I don't know what your numbers are in Wales, but let me tell you in England, because I've got these memorised now. In England, if one in 50 Anglicans in England led, brought one person to church, one in 50, brought one person to church, and that person gave their life to Christ and was transformed by the Holy Spirit, we would transform and turn around church decline in two years. Yeah. Two years. Incidentally, the average size of a parish in England is 50. One in 50, that's all it would take. And we would suddenly have growth in our numbers, not decline. You see, it's not the one big step, it's lots of little ones. And I love the verse in Peter, where Peter says we should have be ready to give a reason for the hope within us. But brothers and sisters, that verse presumes something, doesn't it? It presumes somebody that asked you the question, what's the hope in you? <coughs> brothers and sisters, I suggest for most of us, we are shouting Jesus Christ is the answer to people not asking a question. And our job as Christians is to live provocatively different lives, radically different lives, that provoke people to go, why on earth do you do that? Which then allows you to say, because Jesus is the hope of the world. Yeah. So how can we be that church to radically love and radically serve, to be so generous and welcoming that people ask those questions? Here's, this is by no means an exhaustive list. It's a couple of ideas. And maybe some of you are doing them already fantastic. Maybe you could run a parenting program. One thing we do know is that our congregations are not short of older people. Most people who have a baby or a child have no idea what to do with this new life when it arrives. Some of the best evangelism is done through parenting groups. What about stuff for elderly people who are... Age concerns say over uh, six million elderly people in Britain have nobody other than their television for company. Messy church has already been highlighted. And let me tell you something, the cynics will say, oh, it's only playing. No, it's not. My organization have just done a three year research project funded by the church commissioners of England. It's just about to be published. And the question was, does Messy church do discipleship? And my research director says, in a simple word mark, yes. <laughs> in a simple word. Messy church is discipling children. It <coughs> works, it really works. But what we've got to remember is for those families, that's church. Yeah. It's not going along to another service that we like. It, that's church. So how do we build Messy church to be the authentic community of Christ that we want it to be? So planting more fresh expressions. I, and, and please, please, please don't mishear me. I am not dishing inherited church. I am not. Nobody loves inherited church more than me. But what I am saying is there are so many people out there for whom the jump into what we do on Sunday is just too big. And what Fresh Expressions try to do is build stepping stones to make that bridge a little easier. I'm a big <coughs> believer and in England, we've just done a huge piece of research for the Church of England. It took us five years. And I can tell you that there is nothing growing the church faster in these islands than Fresh Expressions of Church. And it's actually really easy to do. The Church of England has seen phenomenal growth in Messy Church, and you're obviously seeing it here in Wales too. And we haven't put a bean into it. We haven't put a cent into it. We haven't put a person into it. We haven't put a resource into it. It's grown by the serendipity of the Holy Spirit and the creativity of brilliant people like this. What about chaplaincy to schools and prisons and hospitals and so other places? What about uh, giveaways? Um, I have this passion in my heart that I think Easter gets a rough ride in relation <coughs> to Christmas. And I had this vision to give out Cadbury's cream eggs in the community where I worked as a youth minister. The problem was I had no money to buy cream eggs. And cream eggs, as you know, are getting more expensive and they're getting smaller. <laughs> so I, I was a youth worker and I asked my boss, can I have two minutes at the front of church one Sunday? <laughs> Baptismal service. Loads of people I didn't know. Ladies and gentlemen, I've got this vision to give out these eggs at Easter to bless people coming off the train after a long day at work and tell them that God loves them and happy Easter. The problem is I have no eggs. Um, uh, uh, so I, I need you to help me buy some. So you'd like to come and give me some money at the end? That'd be great. 
This woman comes up to me, who was the godmother of the baby being baptized, and said, are you the Irish bloke who did the announcement? <laughs> yes. I should introduce myself. I'm the marketing director for Cadbury. <laughs> She sent me, she sent me two and a half thousand eggs. My youth group, bless their socks, stuck a sticker around every one of them. Just said, a gift from Christchurch Chorleywood. That's all it said. Have you any idea how hard it is to give away an egg? What's the catch? There isn't one. I'm not signing anything. No, I'm not giving, no. Are you wanting money? No! Have an egg. Happy Easter. I got 30 letters to my office. One of which was addressed to Irish youth worker, Hertfordshire. <laughs> People were gobsmacked that church had given them an egg. Yeah. A man comes up to me after the Eucharist on the Sunday morning on Easter Day and said, you gave me an egg on Easter Day and I was so impressed I've come to church. Where's that alpha thing you were talking about? Mm. Oh. Great. Brothers and sisters, we can do this. Don't tell me you can. <laughs> Praying around the streets around where your churches are. God tends to speak to you when you pray. And lastly, actually really doing good follow-up on the people who do come to church. Baptism, sending birthday cards to kids on their second, third, fourth, fifth birthdays, reminding them about kids groups, messy church. It works. But I also want to suggest to you that it isn't just going where Jesus would go, it's also reaching those on the margins of our society. My mother um, tells me uh, I, like, I, I name drop too much. Um, I, I said to the Queen last Friday, I never named her. Um, <laughs> but Church Army's president, until a couple of years ago, was Desmond Tutu, uh, who's the most, one of my heroes. And um, I was preaching in a church uh, in, in Birmingham the following Sunday. And uh, I was preaching on the parable of the lost sheep. I said, Desmond, can you give me some insight into this story so I could just casually say, Desmond Tutu and I were chatting about this passage. <laughs> and, and, and he goes, Mark, you know something? You guys have got this story all wrong. I said, we have? Yes. He said, you walk into your uh, average Anglican church in these islands and you see stained glass windows. Sometime you see one of this story and it looks like that. And he goes, it's just, and he gave me a whole lecture on why Jesus wasn't white with blonde hair. <laughs> but then he said, do you know the fundamental thing that's wrong with that picture? I said, no. He said, he's always carrying a fluffy lamb, isn't he? And Desmond Tutu says, fluffy lambs don't run away. They're well behaved. The one that runs away looks like that. <laughs> <laughs> the one that runs away, the one that runs away is the angry, obstropperous old ram, the one that's been up to its neck in poo, that's got barbed wire all over its coat, the one that it finally does run away, you go, thank you, Jesus. And Desmond Tutu says, no. We have to leave the fluffy ones and run after this one. So my question, ladies and gentlemen, is where in your community is the obstropperous old ram? You're not allowed to say the organist, okay? Where is the obstropperous old ram? Or to put it another way, where are the people who would never step inside the door of your church in a thousand years? How can you find a way to find a way to serve them? Community, I believe. And I can say this safely in Wales, not since Celtic times has community itself been the most fundamental aspect of the art of evangelism. We live in a lonely world of people who are very, very lonely. And the church, when it works right, can be the place where people find belonging and community. If you opened your average church growth textbook in the 1990s, it would have given you three B's. The people believe in God, then they belong to their local church, and then through teaching and prayer, they start to behave as followers of Jesus Christ. That's probably the journey most of you came on. Certainly the journey I went on. That I had a faith, I belonged to a church. I dare to suggest to you that in this post-modern world in which we live, the B's have gone the other way around. That actually people want to belong first. They're lonely. Community is very attractive. And as they do that, they start to become more like us. And then finally the penny drops and they believe. In other words, out of the two roads of the New Testament, I believe most people are coming to Christ today by the Emmaus road, not the Damascus road. But I want to suggest a fourth B, which brings me back to my cream egg. It's as we bless people, they want to belong and then behave. 
and then believe. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So friends, let me say this to you. Please, please, please. Your story was magnificent because you were brought to church instead. So many people who come to church have a bad experience and never come back. And let me tell you, as a, as a, as a leader of a missionary organization, they're much harder to reach the second time. So if people are not welcomed when they arrive, made to feel they belong, they will leave and not come back. See, I used to be a minister of a church. And I, I love church. Everybody knew me. And I suspect everybody knows you. I am not a minister of a church anymore. I'm an itinerant. I'm in a different church most Sundays. So I now see church very differently than I did when I was the leader at the front. So I ask you, even an extrovert like me, what are the two parts of church I dread the most? Number one, in the service itself is the... Peace. peace. I dread the peace. One or two people will politely shake my hand and they'll run off and talk to all their friends. And the other? <laughs> I was speaking at a church in Manchester about being a more welcoming church and I arrived early. Unless you've read my magazine or been on my website, you don't know what I look like, except the Chief Executive Church Army is coming today. So I walked in and sat down. The first thing that's happened to me was a man cornered me and goes, don't sit there. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? You can't sit there. That's Miss Smith's seat. She sat there every year since the Reformation. You've got to sit somewhere else. <laughs> he then asked me, did I bring my book with me? I said, which book? Was your pin book? No. Do I need one? Can I borrow one? Didn't you bring one? No. Why not? Well, because I'm, I'm visiting, and I normally, my church uses a screen. Could I borrow one? Well, I'm quite busy. Could, well, could I? I'll be back in a minute. Anyway, I'm, you can feel I'm absorbing the welcome of this church. So I go out the back and put my robe on and my microphone, and the, the vicar says, are you set for this morning? I say, you'd better believe it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce you to my friend Mark, who's the chief executive church army, who's coming to talk to us today about being a welcoming church. <laughs> I stood up. In the back of the church, a man went, oh, my. <laughs> but here's the best bit. On the way out, he said to me, I didn't know you were the guest speaker. I would have been much nicer to you. <laughs> Friends, can you please help your congregations yeah. to spot people they've never seen, even if there's a risk that they've been coming from before they were born? <laughs> Tell them to say hello. My name's Mark. Well, not Mark, whatever their name is. My name's Mark. You're so welcome. Trust me, it makes a massive difference. <clears throat> Friends, we can do this. We can create spaces that people can come and have fun and have food and discover Jesus in the mix. But friends, you know, as Bishop reminded us at the start, we don't do this as a survival strategy for the church. We do it because God thinks you're fantastic. My mate Chris Russell, no relation, he's Justin's, Archbishop Justin's evangelism advisor, says this. <coughs> you are loved strongly and relentlessly faithfully and without reservation. Your God does not watch you on the side of the... He does not wait to be convinced. The jury is not out. The verdict in Christ is unflinching and irreversible. He is for you always, without hesitation, deviation, and with endless repetition. You see, brothers and sisters, when we really know, really... Do you know the risk for those of us in ministry? We spend so much time doing things for God, we haven't enough time to be with God. And you feel guilty if somebody sees you in Starbucks for the book, and they see, he only works one day a week, she only works one day a week. When do you take the time to nurture your soul, your faith, your prayer life? When do you take time to allow God to just wow you? Because friends, if that doesn't happen, there's zero possibility it's going to happen to your congregations. So I want to tell you, and I'm sure I've got the bishop's support. Please take your days off. Please take your holiday. Please turn your wretched, flippin' phone off and take time to be with people you love and do things that give you life. That's how you'll be better at evangelism. I don't think we take enough time to know that God loves us. The amazing, generous, radical, reckless love of God. That we were loved from the beginning, before anything. Before we ever did anything, before we were ever ordained, before we achieved anything, God was with us from the beginning. <coughs> the God who pours his life out on the cross thinks we are amazing. Brothers and sisters, there is no plan B for the Diocese of St. David's. You're it. God is, and you're not here because nobody else applied and the bishop couldn't hire anybody else. I believe you're here because God put you here. Brothers and sisters, as clergy, 
you need to remember that your life as well can change the lives of those around you. But what I want to say to you is, where do you find time in your life not to be a priest, but to be just a person who finds a way of sharing faith with somebody else? Because brothers and sisters, if you can't find time to do it, trust me, your congregation won't either. Where are the times you escape the religious bubble that we spend our lives in? Just to be a witness to Jesus, to somebody else. <coughs> and you know something, my little theory is that when we do that, God shows up. If we take little steps, God just shows up. So I want to encourage you, I want to encourage you to find time to change lives by being you. But also in doing so, to help your parishioners see themselves as witnesses in their daily lives too. The question we need to ask ourselves and ask the Holy Spirit is how do we become more confident that we actually have something worth sharing in the first place? That the gospel really does change human lives. That we're not promoting some sort of wellness package, like a gym. But we're actually promoting something that changes the course of history. So how do we become more confident in the gospel? But also, how do we help our, co our co congregations be more confident that they have the ability to change the world? And that brings me four square back to where I started, which is discipleship. But we need to be confident, brothers and sisters. We are making a difference. Think of the church in Wales right across this, uh, this um, country, across this province. Think what you're doing. The number of youth groups, drop-ins, debt clinics, um, food banks. The church across this island provides more voluntary service than any other organization on the face of the British Isles. So if you're a church running a food bank, I'm making a difference. Maybe it's time to tell those people why you're doing it. That you're not the Rotary Club with a pointy roof, but actually you desperately believe that God thinks these people are amazing and he died on a cross for them. And maybe if you're writing your next six point sermon on the book of uh, Corinthians, maybe it's time to go and open a food bank. Whichever you didn't do last, brothers and sisters, as I finish, my vision for you, and my prayer for you for this year I've been with you, you in prayer for, the, for this event, has been that more and more people in this beautiful part of God's vineyard would know what it is to find themselves at home in your church. I've used the word home on purpose, because where is home? It's where you take your shoes off and feel you belong. No matter what the world thrown at you that day, you know you belong. Ladies and gentlemen of the Diocese of St. David's, my picture for you to hold on to when I finish is that. Mm. That's what I believe God is calling you to do. To open your hearts to the broken and the lonely and the forgotten. To simply provide home for those who find themselves homeless. That picture of the lonely, decrepit, ancient, <coughs> anxious hippo, sorry, tortoise, opening his heart to the lonely hippo is one that I believe is a prophetic picture for the Anglican Church in these islands. Brothers and sisters, that's the picture I want to leave with you. Because actually I believe with every sinew of my being that Jesus Christ transforms human lives. As I read the Gospels, he healed people, changed people, and I believe with all my heart he still does. And the heart of evangelism is enabling all people, regardless of their age, their gender, their race, their sexual orientation, their status, to know that they are loved, that they belong, that they can be at home.